our fighter has arrived at the gates of the city, and it's an opportunity to take a moment as we change scenes dramatically to think about some of the themes that are hanging like threads in the story that we're developing and talk about and think about how we can use these themes to help bring our story forward and have a story that is more than just a series of yes, no questions and encounters and die rolling, but really something that feels a little bit richer than that and highlights some of the narrative possibilities that solo RPGing can develop. As an experiment, I'm going to do some die rolling to create the scene, and I'm not going to develop the themes at all or even remind you of the themes that have been developed. If you've watched the other video on this character here, you may remember some of them. Uh, you don't need to necessarily go back and watch that video now because I will be discussing the context in a bit. We have this fighter, he's approaching the city, and I want to know, first of all, something about the um, the government of the city or what the what this environment is like. And I'm turning here to the um, the Dungeon Master's Guide. This is the uh, 1979 compilation version of um, Advanced D&D. And I was, I use this often, and I was uh, also having a comment a conversation with one of my viewers on the other video about this and the many benefits of this, what this offers. And I may do a separate video on that as well. But for right now, I'm going to turn to it for a few random tables here. The first being the type of government. Now I'll say this is actually not a table. There, it's a list. It's 19 items on the list, but we will um, use it as a d20 table and just for the um, the random nature. So we rolled a 13 and a 13 on this list, say 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13. It's a monarchy. So uh, government by a single sovereign, usually hereditary, whether an absolute ruler or with power limited in some form. So we've got a monarchy um, government for this city, this uh, developed area. And the other thing we want to do is give us a little uh, environment, a little weather environment here. And I've got my, this comes from um, a book about the weather. This is the Beaufort scale, how you are measuring various uh, weather impacts on land and at sea. Again, has nothing to do with RPGing, but it's a convenient D12 table if you look at it in that manner. So we'll give this a roll and um, just see, this is just environmental, we got one. So we have, um, it's light air, it's just um, really no impact, it's calm basically. We don't really know whether this is day or night, and this is something that I omitted um, in the in the first video. I omitted any discussion of the uh, whether it was day or night when this was taking place. However, based on this character here, and um, I developed my character from this picture, it does look like it is. Um, the, say the dawn or the morning after this terrible massacre and um, invasion of the village of Brill. So uh, depending on how long it took him to travel to the Undercity, we'll say perhaps he's arriving at dusk. And this is relevant because we're going to be going back to the AD&D to take a look at the reception that he might be getting when he comes to this city. And for that, we are going to roll, we're going to adapt this um, a monster or an encounter reaction table. This is a D100 table. We're going to adapt this and um, give a D100 roll here. Whoops, and see, um, see what we get. So we roll a 40. And a 40 on this table is going to be uncertain. Okay, 55% prone toward the negative. So we'll make a note of that. And then finally, for um, setting this up, we want to look and turn toward who might be um, at the city gates, who might we be encountering when we first enter the city. And here, 
um, this is where we have the relevant or daytime or nighttime. I of course said it was dusk, um, so maybe we'll lean toward the nighttime roll, but we'll see. We're going to give this a roll. It's another D100 table, and um, this is not necessarily going to be an urban thing, so we'll see. We got a 93. We'll see if thematically a 93 is going to work. So we got a weir rat um, in the evening for 93, and we have a tradesman if it was the day. So um, we've made a note. We will make a note. We've got the tradesman, possibly a weir rat. It's calm out, and um, this city is part of a monarchic governmental structure. All this die rolling boils down to the notes that I've made here, the monarchy, the weather, that there's a tradesman and a weir rat possibly nearby, and we're going to be getting an uncertain reception from them. Without any other information, without any developing themes, you're kind of left really feeling the absence of a proper GM at this point, because what do you make of all of this? Um, how does it tie together what direction is the encounter going to have? What questions even are you going to be asking about for developing answers? And this is where I think knowing your themes, having developed your themes can really lead the way. So what do I mean by that? Well, now let's revisit, let's revisit the actual situation here and pull out the strands of the themes that had been um, developed there or at least been suggested there by some of the random rolling. First of all, we have this concept that we were in a village that was at present calm, but had been recently destroyed, and that we were needing to travel to the city, which we felt was going to be dangerous and risky, to either find something that had been taken from the cleric in the monastery, or perhaps meet up with a missing member of our party. So that was an initial broader concept that um, I had been thinking about. And as a reminder, I got my initial concept for this video from this World of Warcraft board game portion of the map. So we had been starting in the village of Brill and knowing we were going to need to travel to the Undercity somehow to get to this um, Scarlet Monastery. Now, I also mentioned this um, this valley here off in the distance that may or may not come into play in this scenario in this adventure, but this was uh, dictating the overall lay of the land. And I made some notes about this, that um, there was this concept of traveling from a place of safety to a place of danger, perhaps that we needed to bring or find something, and that we were seeking something in the city, and that perhaps there would be a thief that we might encounter there. But in addition to that, there was um, this concept of the desecration, and we had this word that we rolled on of sacrifice. And this came into play when we entered into the, the guardhouse, the storeroom, and we discovered the orc shaman corpse there that um, whose spirit was still around, perhaps, and this suggested to me that the invasion of the village was connected somehow to the monastery, that perhaps there is something religious or a conflict involving religion or various different viewpoints. Furthermore, we our random um, trinket that we were carrying was a miniature silver skull. And if we think about the, the concept of a skull, and I was making some notes here, this was not really developed um, on camera in the other video, that um, skulls are obviously seen as trophies of war. They are also seen as the uh, containing the life force of a person. And that as such would be um, not only a trophy of war, but the concept of some type of sacred vessel of the spirit. What you may notice here that is 
not noted, I focused on the skull part when I was thinking about this trinket. I didn't focus on the silver part at all. But now that we have encountered a weir rat, now that the randomness has shown us a direction, perhaps it is the silver part that is really the relevant part of this trinket or, or the silver skull together. Because of course, um, silver can be used to um, destroy werewolves, weir rats, and future questions I might be asking about this trinket would be focusing on this, the silver aspect of it. Is it um, something that is going to be used to ward off the um, curse of the weir rat? Is uh, there a, where does this curse come from? Is the curse across the land somehow? Are we going in a direction um, where the lycanthrope concept is going to be a big one? Or is the rat just a symbol of thievery, of an urban setting that's been abandoned? Uh, perhaps the rat being a soul rat, which normally would travel in a pack, perhaps it's semi-domesticated. Maybe the rat and the tradesman are together in some fashion. Maybe they are guides for us to the city. Maybe they're not completely hostile. We have that uh, that die roll that we talked about where we're uncertain about their hostility. But you can see that uh, starting to think about the questions that are coming organically from the die rolls is a way of having a theme develop and in turn having this theme lead the questions. So the fact that our fighter is carrying such an item, surviving in this village, that could be a, um, a talisman of hope. It could be something maybe that needs to be reunited with a cleric at the monastery. Perhaps he is on a mission. Perhaps our fighter is actually somebody who has been chosen for a mission. He looks like perhaps somewhat of a lowly fighter. I mean, he's got, he's got some nice armor, but he's not very well equipped in terms of his weaponry. Maybe he has been, maybe he is a messenger of sorts, and maybe he is somebody who has arriving at the city seeking further information, needing help, in addition to being someone who could provide help. The fact that um, when he travels from the village to the city, it is still a sense of calm that um, the, the danger that he originally anticipated finding doesn't really seem to be existing. The weather perhaps is suggesting this sense of um, this sense of calm that we can develop thematically. The fact that he's encountering a tradesman, a worker in the city, somebody who is perhaps tasked with making the city actually function properly and a common weir rat, um, just a symbol of urban life. This is all in the sense sending me in the direction plus this uncertain reception, slightly negative, but not necessarily overtly so, that perhaps there's an uneasy alliance that needs to be made here. Perhaps the tradesman is somebody who needs to be cultivated to help our fighter further his mission or goal of either finding something in the city or maybe this silver skull talisman that he is carrying needs to be brought to someone in the city. I went to a Dragon magazine which had a series of um, monster ecology articles and I found this economy ecology of the weir rat article and uh, there's the there's the credit line here you can see what issue it's from it's written in a uh, sort of fictionalized way as a journal entry about the experience of a weir rat but the footnotes to the article give some facts about uh, or lore I guess I should call it about weir rats that are relevant to our 
um, to our story here, to the theme that we're developing. And it does talk about we're rats living in communities. We know that rats are communal creatures um, in sewers or other lairs and that um, they are weak fighters. It gives us some stats here for the, uh, their abilities to detect and move silently. This is from, these stats are based on A, D, and D. They, um, it says, unlike other lycanthropes, weir rats can infect their victims with a weapon. A weir rat's bite inflicts one HP damage, but does not infect the victim. An interesting note here. It gives a percentage chance for um, the the infection rate, and um, talks about again how they are pack rats and they are uh, collectors of items. The chance of finding real treasure is twenty five percent. They see poorly. They can regenerate lost limbs. It retains its intelligence in all forms, so it doesn't fight like a cornered rat. This detail may be of use to us in considering, and here's a piece of art, might as well check it out. Uh, this, this detail may come into play as this encounter is developed here, as is this note here. Though communal, weir rats move rather than fight for a lair. After all, they can always find more treasure. However, weir rats are also self-preserving. In a fight or flight situation, they often revert to giant form to flee. Weir rats speak their own language and can communicate with rats as well as with humans, some of which may be audible chattering. So there's a possibility of communication here. Weir rats are immune and vulnerable to many different items, making it difficult to harm them permanently. In a case where silver doesn't work, cold forged iron weapons or even a chemical may prove to be the weir rat's bane. Overall, what we're getting in terms of a storyline and the chaos level of the story, my expectation before doing the rolling was that we would have increased uncertainty, increased danger, increased chaos. But really what we're getting is something that is more like this. We're not, we're not getting a dramatic shift as we enter the city. And this is coming from the, um, the random roles that we have up here and also the themes that we are developing and how they are coming into play. The connection between the silver skull and this first monster that we have encountered. There's definitely, there's some connection there. The rat is not attacking or fleeing, clearly. We're uncertain on the reception. So um, that says to me that there is a bit of connection. And what I want to point out quite clearly is that the theme developing here is a theme of transition, of change. That is absolutely where we're going with the larger themes and you'll see how everything is really pointing toward that. We began by traveling from a village to a city. There was a transition or a change of place. There was, when we got to the city, um, a weir rat, which um, is a, a lycanthrope, and of course that is a symbol essentially of transition. Also, I had failed to determine whether it was day or night and therefore decided that it was going to be undecided, which is a kind of liminal or a transitional place. And I decided that before rolling on the encounter table, so we ended up encountering both that which would be in the day as well as that which would be in the night. What we rolled on for our reception was also an uncertain, slightly negative, but also uncertain overall. We recall too that our word uh, that we rolled on, the concept word that we rolled on initially was the word sacrifice. And of course, a sacrifice typically is something transitioning, something often transitioning from something being alive to something being dead or something being with you to something being uh, away from you, something sacrificed, something in transition. Additionally, our, our warrior, our lone survivor of the village massacre, one could say is a symbol of transition, perhaps a symbol from a transition of war to peace or 
perhaps even going further back, peace to war, back to peace, that he could be, as I mentioned, possibly a messenger. I also see a parallel, perhaps, between this lone warrior and this tradesman. I referred to the lone warrior as a, a kind of lowly or just pedestrian, not so much lowly, but a pedestrian kind of warrior, an average soldier, um, and a tradesman as well, um, an average citizen of this monarchy. Um, definitely with this type of governmental structure, the tradesman is going to be seen as just a sort of typical random person. What does a tradesman do? Well, tradesmen also are involved in transition, one could say. They cause things in the city to work, or they cause some type of state change in the city, perhaps building something or mending something. So again, we can see if we're stepping back and looking at what we are creating here as a type of story that would have uh, the kinds of thematic development that fiction might have, we see very clearly that we are dealing with a story whose theme is transition, change. Perhaps our protagonist is an agent of change. All of these questions can inform moving forward if you um, allow them to the kinds of questions that you are asking when you are rolling to advance the story. As we're the first thing we want to do is a chaos roll. We're going to be rolling with our d12 because our chaos level is an 8. And um, this is just to see if um, there's any sort of branching something or other that could happen uh, with the scene based on this. We rolled a 10. And a 10 on this chart says divination, a neutral or positive event before the planned scene. I don't know if you can see that here. So what this means is we're going to now go to this, um, this chart and take our d20 and give this a roll and see what we get. We got an 8. So an 8 NPC action. Choose or randomly determine one NPC. Roll an idea and interpret. Well, we have an NPC right here. It's the tradesman. What this tells me, and this is a positive event, is that um, the tradesman is going to be inclined to have some conversation with us, to help us in some way. That is going to then definitely impact um, what we're rolling on the destiny check here. The question that we're going to ask now is, um, can we, will this tradesman help us um, with what we seek to do here in the city? And the uh, prior to this role, I would have said perhaps it was unlikely, but now that um, we got this positive event focus, I'm going to say it's likely that he's going to help us. So what we'll do is we'll take again our D12. We're going to get a plus eight modifier to our role. So let's give that um, let's give that a roll and see what we get. We got a 10, so we're up to an 18. And then we go to this destiny check um, interpretation here, and we see that um, not only, uh, yes, we're greater than or equal to 11. So indeed, um, he is going to help us with knowing what we need to do, where we need to go. In fact, he's going to direct us where we need to go and what we need to do. And here's where the development of the themes that we were talking about earlier of transition and change come into play because we need to figure out where in the city we are going to be going to and I think it's going to be a place of transition. So I'm trying to think of places in a city that might be places of transition. Perhaps the first thing I thought of was a graveyard obviously uh, or perhaps connected to a church. The docks perhaps a place where people are entering or leaving the city. That's a place of transition. I'm trying to think of some other kinds of places and um, maybe you'll have some thoughts. This would be how I would then construct the, uh, the table of where I would be going to. And then if this was the whole table, you could just roll, you know, one to three, uh, four, five, six. So we're going to, whoops, we're going to the docks. I thought that was a one. We're going to the docks. Um, that would then take us to a place within the city. If we chose to do this at um, a local level, we could begin to map out the route to the city excuse me, the route to the docks. When we got to the docks, we could create the map of the docks or not. Um, if we were in 
the graveyard perhaps and we wanted to have like a dungeon kind of scene we could be entering into the um, the church or even the graveyard and uh, perhaps there's a crypt in the church under the church and we are walking um, through the catacombs in underneath the church that's a possibility that would create a type of dungeon crawl scenario for you bringing in then if you were here the thematic types of enemies that you would find there if you wanted to do some kind of combat and have a more traditional kind of role-playing encounter where it is combat centric clearly if you were uh, if you went to the docks this could center on perhaps travel or even leaving the city somehow it would be a slightly different kind of encounter but you could see that um, having developed the themes that we we did gave us already some kind of direction as to where we would be going and um, how we would be led there. The other thing, another way to do that would be to try to investigate more what this tradesman actually was or did and then tie into um, whatever he did, the location that we ultimately ended up at. But I like this general concept here because it does tie into those themes of transition that we had talked about earlier. In keeping with the theme of using a board game element in this story, I find myself in this city, and I find myself here at um, the city gates. Now, it's pictured here at day, but in our story, it's still night. And we need to go down to the docks. This is called a wharf here in the city. Interestingly, we're going to be passing by something called Rat's Alley, and Rat's Alley has a sewer hole, and it has some rats here. So I asked myself in this situation how likely is it that the the rat here is um, from rats alley and um, how likely is it that rats alley might be a place that we need to also investigate and I'm go, gonna go for the answer to this question to this little chart here that I have that um, is a, a kind of a, a likely chart and not a yes or a no chart and with all the things that we have to uh, factor in here, I'm just going to say it's possible. I won't give myself, I won't even say it's likely, but it is possible. So this is going to be a straight D20 roll to see um, how likely is it that uh, before stopping at the wharf, something about Rat's Alley is going to come into play. And we rolled a one. So a one is a definite no. In fact, a one is such a definite no that it's telling us to... Um, bypass this rat's alley that rat's alley is going to be a dangerous place so somewhere along the way of our journey to toward the docks there is going to be something extremely dangerous that we are going to need to avoid per the basic fantasy rules we would be checking for a wandering monster once every three turns and one would appear on a roll of one on a 1d6 Interestingly, we have one, if we consider each of these sections a turn, one, two, three, we would be checking for a wandering monster right here in Rat's Road. Given the role that we just had, I'm going to say that um, for this check, a wandering monster is going to appear on a roll of one or two because it is that, whoops, that is that dangerous to us. Actually, probably a roll of one to three because it's that dangerous for us. So we'll do the wandering monster check here and see that we were lucky, no wandering monster. So we've made it through Rat's Road and now we are down into the wharf, into the docks area. Time for another check. We'll, we'll appear just on a roll of one and again, no wandering monster. So we've made it through the dangerous area of the wharf, uh, toward the wharf, and through the city. I wonder, though, whether this rat, this weir rat, is still following us. Is this is this weir, weir rat still with us? And um, again, I have no idea. I'm going to go with it's a 50-50 chance that the rat's still with us. I'm going to roll it on um, this table that I have here. So um, is the rat with us? The rat's going to be with us in some capacity at a 51 or greater. Otherwise, he has vanished and we are once again alone. 
Mm, 93. Definitely the rat is absolutely still with us. And that is a, uh, a rather strong yes for us to be with, uh, for him to be with us. As we enter the wharf, then we need to do a destiny check to see if something has changed. And I also, I need to find out a little bit more about why this rat is, uh, is still with us in some way. Back to the table here, and we are, our chaos level at this point is going to remain, I think we were at a chaos level of eight. It certainly hasn't lessened, and in fact, it's probably risen to nine, precisely because we, um, well, you know, we went through a date, a very dangerous area, this, this rat, rat road was supposed to be very dangerous, yet it wasn't. Later, we discover the rat is still accompanying us. It's probably, this rat probably served as some protector for us not to be bothered when we were in the rat road. So, um, you know, I'm going to find out, is that, is that, am I accurate? Is that the case? Is the rat in some way, is this weird rat in some way acting um, as a, as a protector? as a protector for us. And we'll stick on this, stick on this, uh, chart here. And I'm going to say it's likely, it's likely that he is given, given the circumstances of, of what has happened. And, um, indeed we rolled a 99. Yes, definite. Another strong, another, another strong sense that the rat has protected us through the dangers of the uh, the rat's road and somehow maybe perhaps will help us with in the wharf here. So given that we know that, um, I will say the chaos level is not going to rise. It's just, it will remain the same because it's still a very uncertain area. So we're rolling with a D12 and first thing we want to do entering a new scene is this chaos roll. So this is a straight roll. We got a one. Um, so the scene is going to happen as planned. Well, we don't really know what's going to happen. We're here in the wharf Oops. Um, we're here in the wharf and we have been directed, directed here, directed to the wharf as a place of transition in the city. What happens at a wharf? Well, goods and services are exchanged. Things arrive, things leave the city. And we have come to the city with this weird rat with this silver skull in our pocket and we have been traveling from a the ravaged ravaged village this this item this silver skull has been interpreted differently during the course of this adventure initially we were thinking that it had something to do with the the sacrifice a sacrifice that had taken place the silver aspect of it came into play as we encountered this weir rat who apparently is attached to us in some manner, despite the fact that we're carrying the silver. So that's interesting and un, kind of unlikely development. But now the fact that it is um, something specifically that is small, I'm thinking it is a coin. I'm thinking that we are here, we've been directed to the wharf, uh, to a place where things come into and leave the city because we are meant to be buying something with this coin and obtaining something with this coin. Before we go any further, I want to uh, show you how I do something called the narrative confirmation role. And I use this chart that I have. I don't remember where I got this chart. And I'm not using it as it was intended. It's clearly um, a basic oracle percentile chart to answer a yes or no question. But I'm using it to answer a question where I already think my answer is yes. And what I'm trying to figure out is how strong, how strong a yes is it? How accurate a yes is it? So I want to know, uh, my assumption now, based on what has happened, is that the rat was the one that helped us travel safely through Rat's Road, and the rat perhaps is going to be an ally for us and help us with uh, the exchange we need to make in the war, finding the person who is selling what we need to be buying, something of that nature, a guide for us to the city. 
my question is, um, am I accurate in this assumption that the, this is the purpose of the rat? The way this will work is it's going to be a D100 roll, and I'm just going to be reading up this column. So anything from a 1 to a 10, it's going to be no, this assumption is definitely wrong. Anything from a 10 to a 25, probably wrong, etc. So in sum, the higher the roll that we're going to get on this D100, the more certain we can be that our assumption um, that the rat is helping us is a correct one. And we roll a 43. So this brings us on the chart up to a 50-50. Well, that is thematic. We're still not sure. Um, I think we can treat this rat warily. Um, it is still remaining unclear whether or not he has been um, helping us. I think the, the fact that we made it through the very dangerous area um, unscathed with no encounter and then the rat was with us probably indicates that he's helping us, but it's not clear cut. So again, this, um, this theme of transition, uncertainty, perhaps one foot in, one foot out of whatever continues for our story as we enter the this liminal area of the wharf, this, this area that's both of the city and not of the city, where the city is porous and people are, and things and monsters are coming in and out of the city. What we have in our hand now seems to me to be a coin. A coin can be seen as an object of transition because it will turn itself into something else. So I'm having this thought now that perhaps, perhaps the rat is not meant to help us, but perhaps we are meant to help the rat. Or else, why would this rat be following us along this weir rat? I keep calling it a rat, but the key is it's a weir rat. Why would this weir rat keep following us along when we're carrying something that is silver? So I'm going to ask here, I'm going to go to the destiny check chart and ask uh, this question. Um, are we meant to be helping this weir rat in some way? Is the rat continuing to be with us because we need to help it? And uh, we recall we're at the um, the chaos level eight, so we're rolling a d12. And I think um, on this point, I'm going to say, I don't know. Um, I have no sense here. So we'll go with a 50-50, and that's going to be a plus seven to the roll. And um, let's just see, are we meant to be helping this rat? And we roll an 11, and that is going to be a solid yes. So we have now, uh, we have flipped, flipped the narrative, as it were, thematically, again, this idea of transition and change. We are meant to be helping this rat to change back into its other human form. And if we recall all the way back to the early establishment of the framework for this adventure, when we were mapping out um, where what the uh, places were, we can see and remind ourselves that there were these three places. And I talked about the iconic characters that could be in each of these places that um, we were we were the human here we're the human fighter in the village and a city is going to have a thief and of course the cleric at the monastery um, if we think this notion that the city is going to have a thief that we're going to encounter some thievery in the city we also think about the fact that rats as animals are known commonly as thieves this is leading me to ask another question, namely, is this weir rat, in fact, in its human form, the thief that we are meant to be encountering, is this weir rat suffering from a curse that has uh, changed it into this form from the thief that we are meant to um, be encountering? And all things considered, all of the themes of um, this story that we've been laying out, considered together, 
I'm going to say it is in fact likely that that is the case. And again, we're going to do the destiny check roll. And in this case, we're going to be adding the uh, plus eight modifier and coming up with a four plus eight, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And indeed, it is bringing us into the yes category. It's not necessarily the strongest yes we've got because an 11 is a weak yes, and we got a 12, but it is a yes indeed. So now we're coming to uh, more or less full circle to realize that this we're rat is the, the cursed uh, remnants of the thief that we have been meant, um, that have be, we have been from the beginning um, on our way to find. At this point, I think it's pretty clear how focusing on larger themes or allowing yourself to develop larger themes, such as we have done here, gets you from a situation where you have this, in this case, this lone warrior encountering this weir rat, to a story where you're talking about things such as religious conflict and perhaps how a lone warrior can be an agent of change in an entire civilization, perhaps, that has been infected by a curse. You are talking about things like the transition from safety to, to danger and back again to safety, and that also is a religious theme. You are talking about the nature of um, desecration and sacrifice and how things transition from one state of being to another, and what is the, the mechanism of that transition? How can it be controlled and harnessed for the good? All of these things are themes that can be developed from the story that you have if you focus on the developing story points as one might if one was examining a piece of literature to try to see how the themes emerge from the story points. This can be done in a solo RPG, just as I've demonstrated it here, and it brings the, uh, the story that you're telling through the die rolling, it connects it to larger themes, and it provides a richness and a a narrative uh, direction for the kinds of questions that you are going to be asking and for the kinds of answers that you will be getting and the kinds of uh, questions emerging naturally out of the story, out of the theme, will be richer and will, I think, help you from getting into that uh, the problem, I think, one of the main problems of doing solo RPG work where you just get to a stopping point and you kind of keep wanting to ask a question to keep kind of wanting to get another answer. When that happens, I think it is because the, the themes have not been fully developed, so there isn't a natural place to go. Um, as we've demonstrated here, the themes should be the threads that um, carry your story along from point to point.